Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. We'll begin in just a few minutes. Uh, we're waiting for people to join into the webinar. So thank you for joining the Community Charging Rebates Program webinar. Perfect. It looks like we have a few people joining. We're just about to start. Okay, it looks like we're ready to begin. So hi everyone, my name is Jenna Compton. I'm the Transportation Electrification Financial Coordinator for ODOT. I work predominantly on the Community Charging Rebates Program and we're gonna get into the presentation. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jillian Demidio, as well as Brittany Breen. Jillian, if you introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon, and thanks uh, for uh, joining us during your lunch hour. I can't seem to turn on my camera, um, but my name is Jillian Demedio. I am a senior analyst on ODOT's transportation electrification team, and I work very closely with Jenna on the Community Charging Rebates Program, and I'm going to help uh, answer questions today. So thanks for joining us. Hi, Perfect. everyone. And... Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Go for it, Brittany. Uh, my name is Brittany Breen. I am a senior program associate on FORTH's Access to Charging team. Um, FORTH is providing outreach, education, and technical assistance for the Community Charging Rebates Program. Perfect. And with that, we will begin. So hopefully everyone can see this okay. The purpose of the Community Charging Rebates Program is to improve charging access in communities across the state. We will begin the presentation now, and if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. We will answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation, and links will be provided as we proceed. The goal of today's webinar is to cover some of the basic eligibility information and to discuss the funding available and how it will be distributed. ODOT has contracted with FORTH to provide a high level of technical support both before and during the application process. Keep in mind, this is a soft launch of the program to help you understand the basics of how to prepare for round two. Details are evolving and the best way to stay informed is to check the website, sign up for the newsletter, and join our upcoming webinar dates. As we near the launch of the program on March 5th of 2024 at 9 a.m., these sessions will become more detailed and help walk you through the application process. Before we dive deeper, if there's anyone that cannot stay for the entire session, that's okay. We will be recording the session and posting it on the Community Charging Rebates Program website. I'm going to stay on this slide for a bit of time. If anybody wants to take a photo, now's your chance. This is the February schedule for future information sessions, as well as the office hours that we're offering. You can meet with uh, Brittany or myself in a one-on-one -on -one session during the office hour to clarify on any questions that you may have following any of the information sessions. Okay, I'm gonna move on in just a second. The links for all of the information 
information sessions are provided on the Community Charging Rebates Program website at this time. So the program aims to help reduce the cost for the applicants and place EV chargers in strategic locations, whether it's at multifamily housing, publicly accessible parking, or workplace. Rebates equate to $3,500 to $5,500 per port, or up to 75% of eligible costs, whichever is less. Applicants can apply in two ways, either in, as a pre-installation or post-installation project. We will go over the rebates in the application flow in more detail in the following slides. As stated before, the program will launch on March 5th at 9 a.m. Uh, and close once funds are fully reserved or by early July, whichever comes first. Targeting priority communities is a key element of this program. The goal is to give these communities a head start for the next EV wave. The program looks to place stations within multifamily housing complexes, workplaces, and shopping districts, predominantly in places where people plan to stay for longer periods of time. Here are some of the main programmatic changes that will occur for round two. As mentioned before, we will add workplace charging as an eligible site location. Workplace charging must primarily serve employees who work at or nearby the location. Publicly accessible parking and workplace locations must include a minimum of two ports and a maximum of 12, 12 ports, excuse me. Whereas multifamily housing projects must include a minimum of four ports and a maximum of 12 ports. Third party applicants can apply on behalf of the site owner or authorized agent. However, they are not the rebate recipient. This means fourth can apply, uh, can now help applicants apply for rebates. We have reduced the amount of quotes that are required to one quote only. The rebate levels for publicly accessible chargers has been increased. The rebate, uh, the replacement of broken equipment is eligible, but projects must still follow the minimum port requirements. We will have a new qualified products list of chargers on our website soon. Service level agreements or maintenance contracts will be required for public projects to ensure that these chargers stay up and running. On this slide, we wanted to add a pie chart to help visualize the updated budget. So the funds will be separated into two buckets. There is a total of two and a half million available for the second round. 30% or 7,500, oh, excuse me, $750,000 will be available for non-priority communities and 70% or $1.75 million for priority communities. The rebates will reserve will be reserved on a first come first serve basis. Please note that a single entity cannot claim more than <clears throat> excuse me. Please note that a single entity cannot claim more than $150,000 in rebates per round. Here is an image of the priority type locator map that applicants can use now. If you have a specific location in mind, you can search the address once you open the map and the map will generate an answer. The answer will state whether the site location is in a priority or non-priority community. If you wanna search a general area, you can click on the map on the website and zoom into that location. The key will be on the right-hand side. I want to clarify that every location in the state of Oregon is categorized either as a priority or non-priority community. This tool will only differentiate which bucket of money the rebates will pull from. Here is the rebate breakdown in greater detail for eligible projects. Beginning with the first row, level two chargers that are considered publicly accessible parking will receive $4,500 per port or up to 75% of eligible costs. Uh, I see that there's a question in the chat really quick that I think I can answer. Uh, the map is currently available. It's updated and you can check on it. It will just distinguish if your project site is priority or non-priority at this time. And in the future, it will distinguish if it's priority, rural, and, and or disadvantaged. So moving on. 
Uh, chargers rated at 11.5 kilowatt or higher installed at public sites are eligible for a higher per port rebate. Workplace level two will receive 3,500 per port or up to 75% of eligible costs. Level one chargers for both workplace and multifamily housing will receive $750 per port. However, there are additional port requirements when installing a level one charger, so keep that in mind. Multifamily housing level two chargers will receive $5,500 per port or up to 75% of eligible costs. Rebates are based on either a maximum dollar amount per port as listed in the chart or a percentage of the eligible project costs, whichever is less. To apply for the program, eligible applicants must be a business, nonprofit organization, state, local, or tribal government entity. Businesses and nonprofits must be licensed to do business in Oregon with a valid Oregon business license. They must also be the site owner or authorized agent with a site verification form. Third party organizations may assist eligible applicants in the application process or apply for the rebate on their behalf, but the rebate must go to the entity that incurs the project cost. The three eligible locations are publicly accessible parking, multifamily housing, and workplace. Here are some ideal publicly accessible parking site examples, which include tourist locations, retail stores, tra and transit stations. There are many more. For multifamily housing, some examples include apartment buildings, townhouses, and condos. Lastly, some workplace examples include office buildings, manufacturing facilities, universities, schools, hospitals, and more. Here is a list of eligible costs to begin considering. I won't go over the full list, but I'll, I'll just name a few. Charging equipment, installation, labor, and material costs, engineering design costs, electrical service upgrades, project signage, site lighting, service level agreements, and network agreement costs. I'll leave this slide up for a little bit so you can take a picture and note down the eligible costs. Okay. We'll move on. There are two ways to apply for the rebate. The first is with the pre-installation method and the second is the post-installation method. We will begin with the pre-installation application flow. To qualify for an incentive, applicants may apply prior to the project's installation to reserve funding. We will go into greater detail on the application specifics in the final information session. That way, everyone feels comfortable with the application process. To begin, the applicant gathers and submits all necessary documentation. If there are any errors with the application, ODOT will send it back to the applicant with a note explaining what they need to fix. The applicant will have 10 days to make the necessary corrections and resubmit the application. Once any errors are corrected, ODOT will review the application again and reserve the funds. The applicant then has 270 days to complete construction. Uh, once the post-installation portion of the application is submitted and reviewed, if everything is correct, the application is approved and a payment is dispersed. Now this is the post-installation post application process. To qualify for an incentive, eligible costs cannot be incurred until after the program launch date of June 13, 2023, and applicants must apply for the rebate within 90 days of the installation date. Charging equipment with an installation date before October 6, 2023 is not eligible for round two of this program. The guidelines define the term installation date as the date on which the charging station is affixed to its permanent location, connected to electrical sources, and ready for use. Again, the application goes through the review process. If there is an error, the applicant will receive a notification to fix the error. They will have 10 days to correct the, the error and resubmit the application. Once the applicant resubmits and everything is correct, the project is approved for payment. There are a lot of resources on the Community Charging website for applicants to review, including the priority type locator map, the Climate Office Transportation Electrification website, EV Charging 101, and details regarding Round 1. 
The guide for round two will be posted next week in draft form. Remember, ODOT reserves the right to make changes to the guidelines before the program launch date. And lastly, if you have any questions after the presentation, please contact us at the emails listed on the slides. You can also visit the CCR website or get updates on 4th and ODOT social media pages. There will be a survey at the end of this webinar uh, that you can fill out if you have any questions that come up later, you can submit them in that survey as well. Please begin submitting your questions in the chat now. So I'm seeing a question in the chat. Does the public access for charging need to be 24 seven? So the uh, time for charging needs to be at least 60 hours and it needs to be within um, a reasonable amount of time that applicants can, or that users can visit the charging stations. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm not sure if my Wi-Fi cut out. Um, Brittany or Jillian, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yes. we can okay. hear you. Yes, Jenna, sorry. I was uh, answering questions in the chat and I, I think it's just more efficient no. to do that verbally at this point. Um, okay. So the next one that I see, uh, there's a lot coming in now. So let me, uh, it says, does the public access for charging need to be 24 um, seven? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is that we, uh, public chargers need to be open to the public 60 hours per week. Uh, we loosen that requirement a little bit from the last round to accommodate different types of businesses that may be closed on certain days of the week. So it used to be nine hours per day. Um, and we've just rounded that off to 60 hours a week. Um, the application form will not be the same in round two as round one, but it will be very similar. We are uh, just making, hopefully, what are some improvements to the application and, of course, incorporating any changes that were made between round one and round two. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, would chargers in a publicly available lot for a multifamily qualify for the public access portion of the rebates? Um, so for that one, if if the chargers are primarily reserved for the residents of the multifamily uh, uh, housing, then it would qualify for the multifamily per port rebate. Um, if that is not the case, and it's kind of just equally available to both the public and the multifamily residents, then it then it is going to qualify for that public uh, per port rate. And I think we skipped one question. Sorry, right. Jillian. Uh, so somebody asked, I work in tourism and, and supporting business owners and getting EV chargers installed. Can I assist in the application process as a third party? And, and the answer yes. to that is yes. Yes, that is correct. Um, there was a question about the cost of signage, whether that's an eligible cost, and that is an eligible cost. Mm -hmm. Um, the 60 hours, could the 60 hours be in a five-day period? Uh, the answer to that is yes, I, um, we did address that one. Um, so that is a change uh, between round one and round two. Um, and then Susie, I see you asked somebody to repeat something, um, but we're just getting to that comment now. So if you want to let us know where we cut out, we can happily repeat what was said. Um, another question, uh, Jenna, I'll, I'll kick this one to you. Is registration into the Oregon Clean Fuels Program still a requirement for the customer? Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, and then can we add the PGE incentives to the ODOT incentives? 
Uh, yes. So if you have a PGE incentive or any utility incentive, you have to apply for that incentive before applying for our program. And then when you're going through the application process, you'll list that incentive in the application and it will um, reduce your eligible costs. Uh, and then I see uh, Susie uh, is asking us to restate our answer to the question about uh, multifamily uh, housing charging and whether it would, you know, if it's available to both the public and residents, you know, which rebate does it qualify for? Uh, and the answer to that is if it is primarily reserved for multifamily housing residents, then it would qualify for that that per port rebate for multifamily housing. But if it is sort of equally open to both, uh, and there is no priority status given to the multifamily housing residents, then it is considered a public charger um, and it will get the public per port rebate. Is there a cost to use fourth for paperwork coordination slash submission? Uh, no, there is not. So uh, to Michael answer- asked, uh, does a multifamily charger less than 11 and a half kilowatts qualify for the $5,500 per port? Uh, and the answer is yes, there is no um, tiered rebate for multifamily housing or workplace. So they are either just 3,500 in the case of workplace or 5,500, uh, no matter the, the power level. I'll say we do strongly encourage applicants that are installing dual port chargers to consider higher power level chargers uh, so at least, you know, 9.6 kW, um, but there is no requirement to do so. On a dual port charger, are there two rebates? Yes. So for uh, each charging station, it's based on the number of ports. So there was a question from Emily. It says, if we receive, for example, 5,000 from PGE, would our rebate from ODOT be less than 5,000? So it's dependent upon the amount of eligible costs as well as the per port rebate amount. Uh, when you put your PGE incentive into the application process, that will reduce your eligible cost amount. And so still depending on which one is less, that's how it'll be calculated. Hopefully that makes sense. If you need me to go into further detail over email, I can explain it as well. And, and I'll also share, Emily, that we do have a rebate calculator tool available on our webpage, mm -hmm. which we will uh, update for round two. Uh, you could still take a look at it. It's um, for round one, um, but that should help folks as well uh, figure out what their estimated rebate will be. Uh, there's a question about when the product line will be available to review. Um, we hope very soon. Uh, we are transitioning to uh, a list that has been qualified by the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, uh, which many utilities are now transitioning to and working with them to sort of uh, uh, share our minimum specifications and have them uh, basically create a list of qualified chargers for us. So we hope very soon in the coming weeks. Michael asks if there will be different information at the upcoming webinars. Um, I think probably we'll go over some of the same information, um, but we will get a little bit more detailed. I think last year we did a review of our application uh, closer to launch. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we have plans to do the same. Jenna, I don't know if you have any other thoughts about new info. Yeah. 
So uh, we're probably going to keep the information fairly consistent for the next few information sessions just to get everybody up to speed. And then for our last information session, we'll go over an application overview and we'll walk you through or whoever decides to attend, uh, we'll walk them through the application process with examples so you can see the new application and get familiar with it. Um, Susie asks if fourth will assist with the PGE rebate as well. So I think, uh, so ODOT has contracted with fourth for them to provide technical assistance for this program. Um, to the extent that they assist with the PGE rebate is just providing information uh, to applicants, uh, but they're not going to be applying for that one uh, for applicants unless they have a partnership with PGE. Uh, Mike asked, will single bids require a breakdown like the engineer's estimate did? Uh, Jenna, I'm going to let you answer that one for what needs to be included in the quote. Yeah, so what we want to be able to see on the quote is the number of ports listed, clearly listed, um, the number of chargers, the project site location, um, the cost of installation, and or estimated cost of installation, and the estimated cost of the chargers. If I'm missing anything, Jillian, let me know. But I believe that's everything. Uh, Michael asks, you expect all PGE and Pacific Power approved chargers to be on the EPRI list? Um, I, we do expect that. I, we know that PGE and Pacific Power are also transitioning their qualified products list to EPRI, to the EPRI process. And so um, it's possible we have slightly different minimum specifications uh, and there might be slight differences, but our, our hope is to keep it pretty similar um, and to, to be pretty inclusive so that we have a really robust uh, list that is still meeting, uh, you know, our policy goals um, for the program. And I see that we have a question from Steve. When did you say that the round two application form will be available? So we're going to do a walkthrough of the application so you can visually view it um, in our last information session. However, the application itself won't be accessible until the launch date on March 5th of 2024. And we're gonna open that application at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Jenna, did we share a PDF version of the application last time ahead of time so that yep. folks could? So we, we may also make it available in PDF version, not, not for uh, applicants to submit, but just to make sure that you have, you know, all your, your ducks in a row. And uh, probably that last week in February is a similar timeline for when we can make that available. And if anybody wants to see any of the slides again, um, I can click through them for you now or we can send you a screen grab later. So Susie asked how quickly were funds awarded last round, meaning it took 30 days to award all the funds, 90 days, six months, et cetera. So uh, to reserve the funds, it took, roughly two to three weeks for the non-priority category and it took from so we opened on june 13th till october 6th for the uh priority funds to be used up fully fully reserved and it usually takes we offer 270 days for contractors to complete construction to get the site installed so they can take that time um, if they decide to submit earlier they can submit their application for post installation earlier um, if construction is complete, and then it usually takes around 45 business days to receive your check in hand. Well, Steve asked, was there a slide discussing approval electrical contractors? I don't believe so. We, we don't uh, approve uh, electrical contractors, Steve, but we do offer a, a guide for how to obtain a quote and offer many resources in that guide for how to get connected um, with 
the right contractors. And Matthew asks, will you continue to notify funding recipients once payment is issued? Uh, yes, so once the application is approved and we begin the payment process or to begin processing the payment, um, you will get an email notification that the application has been approved. And Steve, I see that you wrote approved contractors. We don't currently have a list of approved contractors, but we do have a document on our website on how to obtain a quote. Uh, and so you can speak with people who can help provide you with a quote and maybe get you in contact with the contractor. Uh, let me grab that link. While we're on that topic, I will just add that one difference between round one and round two is that uh, electricians who are installing um, uh, any chargers funded through this program do need to be certified through the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program, so EVITP certified. Um, and so we will offer resources. We will be updating this guide uh, to uh, I think it already actually includes how you can find EVITP certified contractors or, or, or those that have certified electricians on staff. Um, but we'll make sure to update it as more and more electricians are, are getting certified, which is happening uh, as we speak. Jillian, we got a question. Any news on the NEBI program? Uh, we don't have any updates on the NEBI program at this time, no. Um, the EVITP certification is a, is a national training program. Uh, there's a question of whether electricians need to be certified at the time of bid or time of performance. Um, I think that they need to be certified when they're doing the work, when they're installing the equipment. Um, so that's, that's a tricky one. I mean, we would definitely recommend finding a contractor that has uh, electricians on staff that are already certified so you don't get in a scenario where you are uh, waiting for electricians to get certified to complete your project. Perfect. And do we have any any last minute questions? We can hang on for a bit longer. Uh, are the information sessions open for registration already? The links are accessible and I believe you can register at this time, yes. I'll just put the CCR website in the chat again. You guys wanna access those. And again, we'll be putting this recording from this session up on our website as well, uh, as soon as possible. So if anybody wants to review it at a later time, you're welcome to do so. Will there be any additional information needed from property owners as compared to round one? So we still have the site verification form requirements, and now we also have the rebate recipient acknowledgement form. We may be combining those documents into one, uh, in which case there might be additional information requested, yes. I'll just add that uh, it's 
it's pretty much the same form. Uh, we are just trying to make it a little bit easier, reduce the number of forms that need to be filled out. So combining them into one and, you know, so that the wording might vary slightly, um, but it's the same information that's that's being requested. But we won't be accepting the old site verification form document. Can the rebates still be assigned? Oh, still be assigned to the installing contractor. So the individual incurring the project costs is the one that the rebate will go to. The another way to say it is that the rebate always goes to the equipment owner, um, and so that that may or may not be the property owner, the real property owner, or it may just be uh, uh, an entity that is going to own and operate the station. Um, but that is where the rebate goes. Perfect. Do we have any remaining questions? If not, uh, you guys will also be sent over to the survey result where you can type in your questions as well. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining and for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can always contact or reach out to the emails listed on this presentation. All right. I hope everyone has a nice day. We're probably going to sign off shortly. Thanks, everybody.